A lot of leaders are worried about what's going to happen with employee expectations, labor laws, and unionization. My next guest, Jason Weiner, is going to share different ways that we can structure our businesses so that our employees have more skin in the game. Jason Weiner is the principal of the boutique law and business consulting practice, Jason Weiner PC, and co-founder of the Colorado Cooperative Developers. He has advised on more than two dozen worker cooperative conversions, several multi-stakeholder ownership conversions, and more than a dozen platform cooperatives. He's a lawyer who is also an owner, has employees, and especially has a bird's eye view of what's working or not in the world of corporate structures. Jason Weiner, welcome to How I Turn the Corner. Thank you, Kendra. Good to be with you. I'm so glad you're here. So I want to start off, um, you know, most of our listeners run small businesses. Um, so tell us, just educate us on the different ways that we can structure a business that is more beneficial to our employees than just a typical LLC or a sole proprietorship or the others. Well, I'm one who says the legal structure isn't the leading uh, indicator of how a business treats its workers. It's the lagging indicator. Um, it's really more about culture, leadership style, communication, and the humanity or the human-centered uh, nature of the business and the culture in the, in the organization that matters most. But there are different organizational designs that give workers a voice, uh, center them in the discussion, and give them access to the same potential and same benefits that uh, the business owners have, which really is align It's about aligning the incentives and treating workers as central to the value that's been created that's being created by the business rather than an externality or an expense on the p l okay so what are some different ones i mean what's the difference between like a, a cooperative and an esop and some of the others yeah so there's a variety a handful of legal structures that are used for employee-owned business a cooperative is a democratically governed uh one member one vote type of business structure uh, it can have management, but it's really more about democratic control and the autonomy of the workers as the owners of the enterprise. An ESOP is more of a tax-driven structure that uh, has a trust in place. It's a regulated trust that owns shares in the company, and the trust receives dis uh, the, the flow through of income from the business to build value in the trust shares, which are used for retirement. Um, it's akin to, for the worker, it's it's essentially a 401k in one's own company, and the value of that account increases the longer that you've been with the company, and the value can be taken out upon um, retirement, and it can be rolled over into a separate 401k um, when somebody leaves the company. There's a variety of other hybrid structures that have uh, broad-based cap tables for corporations, profit-sharing plans, restricted stock. Uh, purchase programs, phantom stock, stock option plans. So there's a variety of ways that businesses can put workers into positions of ownership, either for profit sharing or for access to all the bundle of rights that go with ownership. And that's really more about um, kind of engaging workers at a fundamentally deeper and uh, more profound level than just profit sharing. Mm -hmm. So you you kind of cut your teeth um, on this when you were a an in-house counsel for a, a company. What was the motivation for them starting and what was that first experience like? I came on when they were about five years old. This is uh, a Boulder-based employee-owned solar company, Namaste Solar, uh, which is now, gosh, close to 20 years old. Um, the motivation, it was part of the DNA of, of the founders when they formed the company. They wanted this to be owned by the workers and reflect the values of a worker-owned enterprise. And so they started out using an employee-owned structure under the corporate uh, corporate structure. When I came on in 2009, we started going through a process to realign the legal structure with the organizational and cultural um, reality. And so we eventually converted into a cooperative. So we operated on a one member, one vote basis. We shared profit on the basis of our labor, time uh, worked at the company on, in a given year. And um, the company grew and grew. And I was the only lawyer in house. I played a part in every major function of the company from 
uh, senior leadership to HR and employment to corporate finance and, and fundraising um, to solar policy and all the rest. Uh, but the belief was that if workers are have a stake in ownership of the company, that the product and service they deliver is of a fundamentally higher quality. And so we used to take pride in saying that there's at least one owner, company owner on the roof of every project they were installing. And that not only made customers feel better, but it did uh, pay dividends in terms of the quality of work, uh, the profitability of the company, turnover rates, uh, employee satisfaction, all the major indicators that companies die for were baked into the undercurrent, the DNA of the way the business was structured. So it was really a matter of kind of putting our money where our mouth was. That's amazing. So was it, was it a, is it hard to set these structures up? I mean, what, tell us a little bit about the process. Well, a business can start out as employee owned or it can convert to employee ownership. It's uh, from a legal perspective, not all that complicated. What's more complicated is to go through and assess the readiness factors from uh, leadership and managerial competence to financial and tax planning to um, culture and organizational development. Those take a lot more time. And I'd say those are really key factors in really any succession planning exercise or any merger and acquisition transaction to determine the business can really function without the founders. And for an employee ownership conversion, it's really the same assessment that needs to be done, plus a little bit of extra planning for what it looks like to have workers engaged at a variety of levels within the company. And so it's anywhere from, we've done these in as short as eight weeks to as long as 18 months. Uh, the more planning, the more people who are involved, the better the end product and outcome, uh, just from an engagement and, and knowledge and education standpoint but they can be done pretty simply in terms of just a legal restructuring, but that's really only scratching the surface. This is really part of an overhaul of the organizational strategy and uh, the underlying system by which the company operates. When you pull somebody with the power of a founder out of the picture or change their role, it leaves a substantial vacuum and that needs to be planned for. They can't just be handled by accident or uh, you know, reactively, that really has to be part of a proactive plan to develop leaders, adjust culture, and give workers the chance to see their imprint in the in the milieu of the company. That's what gets people bought in. Hmm. So, so you've gone through a similar structure with your own company as well. To a degree, I went through an exercise uh, before the pandemic to plan out and really roadmap what a conversion to a cooperative would look like. Our firm is very small uh, by any measure. We're a total of eight people, uh, probably soon to be closer to 11 or 12, but we're too small really to really be looking at. Not everybody is similarly situated in terms of um, experience, role, geography. So um, we went through that exercise and realized it really wasn't a good fit for us at the time. I did take on a partner uh, at the beginning of this year, and that was an incredible experience to just go through uh, the alignment process and the courtship process and develop a sense of, of trust that, you know, we were in this with the same values and same purpose, but that we had complementary skill sets and uh, passions. And it allowed us to really both leverage up our uh, level of commitment, knowing that, you know, there was another person there to catch our back if we needed it. And so to see Jacqueline kind of uh, rise to the challenge has been just incredible. Um, and she's been with us for a little over two years. So this is not somebody I brought in from the outside. Somebody who's been with us and just, just an incredible attorney and incredible human being, somebody I'm really proud to call my partner. Mm -hmm. So I imagine, and, and you sort of alluded to this at the beginning, but um, it's just not enough to only have this be an, like an you know employee owned cooperative. You have to put so much more structure in and um, to lead even differently. So with your just perspective of watching lots of businesses do this, what have you noticed are some of the key components that have to be in place and be managed through over time to really make this successful? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, the number one is the cultural health. There has to be an assessment and determination that the culture within the organization has the conditions of health, not just the absence of toxicity, but the presence of health. There has to be 
good communication. There have to be strong systems, processes, and an active practice of feedback. There have to be ways of dealing with the inevitable tension that arises that can't be a dirty word, that can't be something to avoid, that has to be embraced within the organization across levels, disciplines, roles, power structures, identity. It really has to be overt within the culture that there's a proactive approach to dealing with the basic elements of human, human interaction, because that's what organizations are. They are groupings of people. They are not groupings of legal papers. They're not groupings of dollars. <laughs> They're groupings of people. Employee ownership legal structures are simply the legal documents, guardrails, and parameters, protocols by which humans engage. And we're talking about inducing people or encouraging them to engage at a transformative, transcendental level, not just employer, employee with a power dynamic, a, a, a hierarchical power dynamic. We're talking about encouraging people to collaborate, let their guard down, operate at a level that I would submit is just simply not normalized and prevalent in American society. It's much better practiced in communities in Central and South America, in uh, parts of Western Europe and Asia, but not to a degree here. We still lionize power in you know, fairly oppressive ways. Uh, and so we really have to determine uh, the organizational healthfulness. The second is operational competence in terms of the presence of leadership capabilities, the resources for training, and the knowledge that people at the edges have the power to control and adapt systems. That's not about legal either. That's about understanding how operational systems interrelate with one another. And the more power that can be moved to the edges, the better the organization will be to adapt and evolve and to take feedback. Those are really strong indicators. The last is a financial test. It's really, does the founder require a level of financial uh, output that the company can afford to finance, either through seller financing, bank financing, future profitability, or worker capital contributions. That is relatively easy to determine at the outset. There are emerging um, pools of capital that are available for uh, exiting founder uh, transactions like this. Uh, there are more and more coming online. There's tax that goes with it. But really, that's a question of, is the future capacity of the business sufficient to pay the founder out what they're looking to get out of the business? Hmm. If they're looking for a windfall, you know, the reality we have in America, the status quo of private equity and, and public markets providing capital are really skewing the reasonable expectations of most business owners. 80% of small business owners in America have no succession plan and no viable buyer. And yet, small business in America is the number one employer of workers in the country. So we have a basic mismatch of expectations when it comes to who employs workers and what's going to happen when that owner is looking to retire and whether or not they have the planning and, and buyer in place. Family's not interested. There's no successor. Uh, and so employees are really, in some cases, in some communities, the only viable buyer for these businesses to remain viable. That's really sad, actually, in a way, when you think about how many jobs and, and families would be affected by just this lack of planning. Yeah. Um, and I see that as well. I mean, I see this quite often, matter of fact, or a owner just decides out of the blue, it's time to retire. And and they they uh, want us to go recruit and find them the next you know, CEO and the, and the next owner. And it's like, well, this is way more complicated than that. And yeah. looking at your balance sheet, like nobody's going to buy this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mentioned that because private equity has, you know, yes, created these stratospheric expectations, but what's private equity looking to do? They're really going to lever up a lot of these companies and pass the buck to the next owner. And they usually do that through public markets or strategic acquisitions. There is a very clear, deliberate financial plan for private equity to come in and pay multiples far above reasonable value for a lot of these companies, someone's going to lose out on that. And it's usually the worker. So in many cases, to preserve jobs, preserve viable businesses and community, we need to be thinking about what's a reasonable value that a business can sustain to pay out an owner. Yes, there's goodwill. Yes, founders took a lot of risk. And yes, they deserve 
you know, to retire with dignity, but that doesn't necessarily always equal the value that a private equity fund is willing to pay when they're backed by pension funds and sovereign wealth dollars. So all of this reality led uh, me and, and some other uh, leaders in the state to advise the governor, Governor Polis, to form what is now the Employee Ownership Office and the Employee Ownership Commission, the purpose of which is to provide the education and tools for businesses and workers to plan for employee ownership transitions. And so we've developed a host of resources. There's a website that your listeners can go to if they're in the state. It's the Employee Ownership Office through the Office of Economic Development. I think it's, they can Google Colorado Employee Ownership Office. There's an entire free learning system for uh, for business owners that has step-by-step -step guides on how to do this. There are concierges and navigators they can talk to uh, and all manner of access to the service providers to uh, support them in that in that learning and in the transaction itself. Hmm, that's amazing. So what what have you what is what have you discovered through that? What are you noticing? The real linchpin is a lack of education and it's not a lack of consumer facing education. It's a lack of education among advisors, lawyers, bankers, CPAs, who are usually the first people business owners go to when they want to talk succession planning, HR professionals, consultants, and very few service providers know that employee ownership is a viable option. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the experience. And so they advise against it. So we're facing an uphill current of advisors that are simply not trained to know this is viable. We're putting in place the mechanisms and incentives to try to reduce those barriers. And the governor has, it, it, he issued in 2019 an executive order to form this commission to tackle just those things, to tackle the barriers, reduce them. There is now a very, very well-funded tax credit. We have the richest tax credit in the country, $10 million for five years for business owners to transition to either a co-op, an ESOP, or an employee ownership trust. It's a matching tax credit for up to $50,000 in the case of a co-op or $100,000 in the case of an ESOP. Half of that is a tax credit that can be transferred. Uh, so 25,000 or 50,000 in actual tax credit dollars from the state. There's a corresponding loan and grant program as well to ease the financial costs associated with these conversion um, fees and costs. Hmm, that's amazing. Wow. I love that. And you spearheaded a lot of this. Good for you. So with when you think then about the stickiness of a culture, um, you, you know, you mentioned with especially like with Namaste Solar, that it improved the customer experience, which is always good. And it also um, improved you know, retention and, and reduced that need for constantly recruiting and that revolving door of talent that can happen when the culture isn't sticky. Um, what are the things have you seen now in the more recent days with some of these structures? I mean, what are other bottom line results that, that we could talk about with our, with our leaders, you know, aside from those two kind of more obvious ones? Well, right now, you know, the labor market's incredibly strong for at least the last two years. Uh, it was a very worker oriented labor market. We struggled for a year and a half to find the type of the, the kind of talent we need to grow. Um, and uh, so just basic recruitment hiring uh, was a challenge. These structures and, and, and these cultures that prioritize the full human, the full self, um, you know, that don't force people to check a part of themselves at the door when they come into the workplace are better able to translate to the cultural milieu of the time, especially the younger generation of workers are looking for cultural authenticity and basic dignity. And that's hard to fake. And so they know it when they see it. And, you know, putting budget dollars to the kinds of values that companies talk about is really where the rubber meets the road. So we're able to better recruit, better retain. We've hired people away from big law firms ourselves. We've been able to recruit and punch way above our weight because we have the best possible spokespeople. We have our actual employees meeting with candidates able to say, this is the best place I've ever worked. Here's how, here's why, here's what's at stake. Uh, we've identified and we publicly talk about, at least in our profession, burnout and a lack of mental health are the two most prevalent occupational hazards. We've not coincidentally made those the two most important strategic priorities for our organizational health. 
investing in mental health resources, advocacy, and destigmatization. And we're doing that not only within our organization, but also in terms of the services that we offer and the types of clients we recruit. So we've made this a full court strategy to make sure that our workers are fully aligned with the type of work we do and the way we do it. And that means that people are happier, stay longer, and are more engaged, but we're not over utilizing people. They're contributing as much as they're able and they have the resources to take what they need so that they can continue to be here, happy and thriving and developing year in and year out. For us, it's a long game. And I think anybody who's seen what the labor market has done to business in the last three years knows that it is incredibly expensive to recruit, hire, and retain talent. Oh, Full for sure. Stop. Full stop. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I mean, I, we've been running these numbers, these bottom line numbers for years. And um, even just this last year, really did some deeper studying around just the cost of onboarding an employee and the amount of time. And in a business like ours, you know, we're a services-based business like you, where we're tracking all of our hours. It's really clear to see utilization of, of, side-by-side -side staff of someone who's been around for a while and is fully onboarded and somebody who's brand new and has not and immediately see the lack of utilization and and then translate that into dollars and it is incredibly expensive so if you've ever if you've got people leaving and you're onboarding new people god that also has to be factored into the kind of the the costs there and that's where i think profitability is eroded so an intangible quality i found myself spending really untold hours each week devoting energy and resource to the draining, like to, to, to energy drains within the organization. I found myself once asking, why am I not devoting nearly this much energy to the healthful, high-performing, deeply engaged peers? And I found that, you know, we just have a tendency, I think, to really focus our energy on trouble spots and on, on problems rather than on healthfulness and on the people who are thriving and who need further support to develop faster. So I had to make that choice. And once I made that choice, everything became clear and easy. And since then, I've tried not to go back. I've said, we're only devoting energy to the things, not only, but most of our energy to invest in the things that are working, the people who are working and the systems that are working and continuing to align and refine uh, you know, those elements of compatibility and helpfulness. And that has a way of paying dividends. And yet at this, by the same timeline, we've seen our revenue grow and we've become a far healthier organization. And um, it's not coincidental. It took, it takes leadership, energy and resource. And I, I look at organizational resources, not just time and money, but I look at it as energy is the product of time multiplied by attention. And those two things are limited. And for any leader in any organization, that's fundamentally their most important currency is their energy. And if the work is a source of drain, they're going to devote their energy elsewhere, either to looking for another job or focusing on other parts of their life. And we need people really motivated to to build and construct and progress organizations. And that means that their attention has got to be focused on the things that really add value. Hmm. So do you, um, what, what are, what are some of the things that you think are not working in this space? Like, what are some areas where you would turn and say, this just doesn't seem to really solve the problem. Like I, <clears throat> I think we hear a lot about like unions as being one of those things. Um, what are, I mean, t let's talk about unions for a second, because yeah. um, I grew up in a union household where my dad had a business that had, had a union. And so I'm very familiar with that side of it. And then now with the work, you know, both of us do, we see the other side too. What, what, tell me, talk, let's talk about unions. What do you, what's your yeah. opinion? So I actually grew up in a union household myself and I went to law school. I went to undergrad, uh, to study labor relations. I went to the industrial labor relations school at Cornell. I was a labor studies major went to law school to become a labor lawyer and practiced as a union side labor lawyer for a brief period in my career. Uh, and what I ultimately came away from that feeling was it's an important noble fight to counter the excesses of management power in big corporate environments. But the union pursuit, it's the chosen dynamic in this country. It's the chosen policy framework we have, which 
is not the only framework. There are other systems of collective bargaining around the world. The one we have is an adversarial duality between uh, labor unions and management. And it is a, it's an adversarial system. And it's also a system that pits workers against the forces of management but it doesn't create incentives for co-creation and collaboration. It's based in a scarcity model where resources are limited and it's a zero sum game. My view is, and this is the same view I have, uh, the same critique I have of, of much of the environmental movement. It's, mu it's very much a counter and defend strategy than it is one of building, progressively, proactively building power. And so it's it's necessary but insufficient as far as I'm concerned. In, unions are a critical component of the social political fabric in this country. If we didn't have labor unions in the private sector, we would have, you know, we wouldn't have had the 40 hour work week. We wouldn't have minimum wage and fair uh, fair labor uh, wage laws. We wouldn't have uh, safe working conditions, and we wouldn't have any method of redress for workers who were aggrieved by the excesses and oppression of management. I believe that there's a place for it, particularly in large-scale corporate settings where a single worker simply has no power relative to the resources and power of the corporate enterprise. That said, I think it's insufficient to provide the conditions of health. And so what I suggest and submit that we need to move to another stage within American capitalism to be actually proactively building power and wealth within the worker class by aligning incentives. It's, it's an add-on, it's a supplement to the power dynamic. The union movement, I think, provides an important floor, but I don't think it's ever going to be enough to create the conditions of wealth and power that workers are fighting for. To do that, I think we're really going to need to build collaborative systems where workers and management have aligned incentives to work together to build the pie, to grow the pie, and to progress the enterprise, add profitability, where workers share in it. So I think we need more robust profit sharing plans. We need more employee ownership business models, many of which will be unionized. There's a scale at which even employee ownership fails to rep adequately represent the voice of the worker. And that's what the union is. It's a collectivist forum to represent the voice of each worker. And a co-op is an important way of building power, building power for workers. Unions are important ways to defend powers for workers. But look what's happened. Unionization rates in America have plummeted. And it's no surprise. We've also seen, at the same time, uh, deregulation and the largest, fastest growing wealth and income inequality in American history. And those two things really, if you looked at the graphs, they go, they're in parallel. Union, uh, the union decline and wealth and income inequality, those two graphs are nearly in tandem going in opposite directions. Hmm. And it's no coincidence. But I think part of the solution has to involve worker ownership. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a perfect spot for us to end. What is the best way for people to find you and utilize your services? Uh, much more information about us and what we do can be found on our website, www.jrwiner.com. You can find us on LinkedIn, uh, JWPC or Jason Weiner PC, as well as on Twitter. Uh, but our website has a huge set of resources on our blog, and we have a free course for designing a community enterprise like a co-op. Um, it's a free course on our website. Follow us, uh, su subscribe to our newsletter, and you'll see all the all the events that we're promoting and participating in and all the practice areas that we're excited to, um, to through which we support our clients. And we'll put all this also in the show notes as well as the YouTube notes for any of those, any of you who couldn't get a pen out quick enough. So that's all the details will be here in, in, in the notes. So, well, thank you so much, Jason. This has been such an amazing and enlightening conversation. And I think I'm feeling uh, inspired to change the way that turning the corner is structured. So definitely you and I are going to continue to have deeper conversations about that. <laughs> You're welcome. All right.